that is the resurrection message right there. He is risen and you will say? Amen. Amen. Well, you know, this morning, oh, I've just lost my notes. There we go. Here we go. <laughs> so this morning, um, I really want to look at what's in the name of Jesus. You know, we just sung it, didn't we? Didn't we? You know, we just have sung. I may as well sit down, actually, because we just sung everything that's in my message. Praise God. God just keeps on, um, you know, doing what he needs to do in his house. And every time I speak, I have to say that the, the worship team have, you know, just gone before me. And that is what the Levites are called to yes. do, can I say. They go before, they hard the way, and they do all the battle work. <laughs> so we can come up here and just sit into the glory of God. <laughs> but, you know, I really believe that um, if there's ever a time to remember, you know, the name and be reminded of the power that comes, uh, you know, from the name of Jesus, mm. it's actually today. Mm. It's actually today that we get to remember the name that has been elevated above every other name. Amen. The day when today the Ecclesia, right around the globe, we come together and we, we celebrate together Jesus' triumph. Over the death and the victory yes. that is found through the resurrected life yes. that brings with it power to transform lives. Yes. It brings with it hope to restore yes. and it brings with it redemption and love yes. and grace yes. unending. Yes. And so this morning it feels fitting to proclaim the message yes. that there really is no other name like Jesus because of God's unmerited favour. There is really no story that he can't also redeem. Yes. Yes. You know, back in um, August, James is not going to like me saying this. My husband here, Jamie. <laughs> 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 it's okay, it's not that bad. Um, but back in August, my husband and uh, August tw uh, 2020, I should say, my husband uh, Jamie and I we celebrated our anniversary, our 20th anniversary. Um, oh, actually, it's 2015, but I'm saying that was last year, 2020. Oh gosh. Anywho, we um, we celebrated our 20th anniversary in 2015 down in Cradles Mountain in Tasmania. Anyone been there? Yes. Yeah, lots of you. Awesome. Well, we had arrived in Tasmania with our hearts set on hiking around the mountain and also to walk around the Lake St. Clair. But when we got down there um, in Tasmania, an unprecedented storm had set in and the entire region was closed down. And the mountain it too was closed down from hikers, so you know that was out of the, the question. It was deemed too dangerous to walk on. Lake St. Clair was also closed. But there was one simple forest walk that was still open to the public. And so Jamie and I, the day after we arrived, we decided to go on this little walk. Now this walk um, is an all-purpose walk. It takes about 30 minutes to do the loop, and it's really simple. And anyway, so Jamie and I, we decided to take this little meander. And we only took with us a small bottle of water. Um, and I also, foolishly, I now say, uh, decided to wear a pair of fashion ankle boots that I bought a few months earlier from Paris, <laughs> as we do when I was in my mum a few months earlier. <laughs> as the day began, uh, Jamie and I, we, we set off and, you know, we, we, what we thought was only going to take a 30 minute loop uh, around this uh, beautiful um, enchanted forest. It's, it's actually called the Enchanted Forest. How hard could that be, right? Um, so we were, you know, just enjoying the magical uh, rainforest and the cascading uh, river that uh, the waterfalls and all that sort of stuff. And the snow it just made this uh, this forest even more enchanting. And so Jamie and I got lost, quite literally, in its beauty. It wasn't until we were well past the hour that we had realised that we had left this forest floor and we were now heading up the mountain. We had a moment where we could just, we, we, we were deciding, do we turn back? <laughs> do we try and find our way back that way? Or do we go forward? Well, my husband is a real adventurer. <laughs> and you know, he's sort of like a hand in the head kind of guy. So you know, he was like, oh, she'll be right, I'll get us around. 
down this mountain with just our little bottle of water or with my fashion boots on. <laughs> well, as it turns out, there was nothing easy about this mountain trek. Our misadventure lasted for hours and at times it got a little harrowing. It also, you know, there were sections that were really steep and then because it was icy, the ledge, it was really dangerous as we were walking across. And there were moments when Jamie had to lift me up. And by the third hour, rescue helicopters were circling around us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> Needless to say, this little adventure of ours <laughs> is a story that we, we do we, we call from time to time, and it's something that we will never forget. But actually, it's to do with our boots. <laughs> Oddly enough, that Jesus has reminded me of his atoning sacrifice. You see, both Jamie's work boots and my Paris fashion boots, they became completely uh, dirty and scuffed and, and they, I thought that they were completely unsalvageable. I remember at one point uh, on our walk along um, this, this mountain trek, I remember saying to Jamie, I have ruined a favourite pair of boots. <laughs> they are never going to be, you know, salvageable. I'm never going to get these boots back. But you know, that changed after we trudged through an, about an acre, uh, an acre long worth of knee-high snow. You see, though I thought our shoes were unsalvageable, they were ruined forever. When I awoke the next day and looked at our pair of boots that were drying near the heater, what we discovered was that they were washed completely clean. Both Jamie's work boots and my fashion boots had been washed by the snow and they were now the cleanest pair of boots that either of us actually owned. In Isaiah 1.18, the Lord describes our sins in a similar, almost impossible fashion. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. You know, through James and my boots, they were cleaned white as snow. But Jesus reminded me that that is exactly the same as his atoning sacrifice. Jesus' blood washes away all of our sins. He makes us white as snow. And when Jesus, and when we choose Jesus as our Savior, we are made into a brand new creation. Perfectly clean and spotless. As Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, if anyone is in Christ, the new has come. The old has gone. The new Amen. creation Amen. is here. Amen. We are a brand new creation inside of Jesus' perfection. And the Father sees us as clean and perfectly whole through his beloved Son who paid for it in full by his blood. This means that what the Father sees is not our sinful nature that once was, but rather our perfectly, newly washed Christ covered for our likeness. This is his amazing grace that though we were dead because of our sin, God in his rich mercy and love gave us new life when he raised his son Jesus from the dead. And as if that's not enough, he then seated us with him in the heavenly realm because we are now united Amen. with Christ Jesus through his death and resurrection. What an exchange! He who is sinless for our sins so that we could partake in his life, in his glory, become friends of God and inherit the promises and the inheritances Jesus deserved alone. Unmerited favor by the name above all names. You know, there's a scene um, in the Chosen series. Who, who, who has seen the Chosen? Oh my gosh, if you have not seen the Chosen, it's the biggest crowdfunded uh, Christian, well, it's the biggest crowdfunded movie series of all times. But it's about Jesus and his disciples. 
sons, and oh my gosh, it is amazing. But you know, there's a scene, a particular scene in this movie. For those of you who have seen it, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's, it's breathtaking. And it's where one day everything changed for Mary Magdalene. She had just had an encounter with Jesus. And from one encounter, Mary became completely free from bondage. She was liberated from her, the demonic afflictions that she had over her. She was released from the grip of the evil one. She was washed completely clean and she was made into a brand new creation. And everyone around her could see that she was different. Yes. From that one encounter with Jesus, Mary's life turned around and in the movie, she says this timeless one-liner as she's explaining to Nicodemus who was so puzzled why he couldn't heal her. And she says this beautiful one line, I was one way and then I was completely different. And the thing that happened in between was Jesus. Yeah. Jesus makes all things new. Yes. We were one way, but now we are completely yes. different. We have been made brand new, a new creation through Christ Jesus. Amen. I am testament to this very Magdalene story in so many testament of becoming a brand new creation in Christ as well. Not only was she redeemed from a life of misery through demonic oppression, but she also went on to become one of Jesus' most devout followers, yes. welcomed into his inner circle. Yeah. And if that's not enough to exonerate Mary's past, she was then honored with becoming the first to receive, the first to speak, and then the first to embrace the, the risen Lord Jesus yes. on his resurrection yeah. day. to receive the fullness of life that he promised. You know, when Jesus cried out, it is finished. Which in Greek it actually means paid in full. Not conditional, not in part payment, not read the fine prints, terms and conditions. No, when Jesus said it is paid in full, it is finished, he was saying he accomplished it all. It was completely complete. He paid the full cost for our redemption and salvation. We have been white, made white as snow, brand new creations in Christ Jesus. When he redeems, he really redeems. You know, Jesus is the most influential person in history, isn't he? You know, Jesus is coming. History was defined by Jesus' coming. <laughs> Our calendars are marked by AD before Christ, and I'm sorry, BC before Christ, and AD, the year of the Lord. Jesus' birth ushered in a whole new era. We crossed over from BC to AD at that significant moment in history. The old was finished, and something new and wonderful had been birthed when Jesus arrived. In fact, hundreds of year old prophecies were fulfilled on that glorious starlight evening when a baby boy was born in Bethlehem and was given the name of Jesus, the one who would save his people from their sins. And you know, something similar happened years later at Jesus' death and resurrection too. Once again, the old was superseded and something new and glorious was birthed. Yeah. And prophecy again was fulfilled in fact the meaning of his name, Saviour, Redeemer, Messiah, Deliverer, Rescuer. Yeah. It became a fulfillment to, to many prophecies when Jesus died for our sins, conquered the grave, and rose again victorious. You see, Jesus he came as the new covenant. Yes. He came to do away with the old and usher in something gloriously undeserving, unmerited, full of grace and love that is available for all of mankind by simply believing in the name above all other names yes. and that name is Jesus. You see, where the Israelites were bound by a covenant of laws and regulations 
that they had to obey religiously in order for God's blessing and protections to be over them. And where the Israelites were bound by ritual ceremonies to atone for their sins in order for death to not be the consequence of those sins. The new covenant that Jesus purchased by his very own blood supplants the old law that was punishable by death and instead Jesus bore our sins once and for all. And because of his finished work on the cross that was paid in full, God promises us that he will never again remember our sins and our lawless deeds because he, Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse on our behalf. Death no longer has its sting. Sin no longer has power over us and our lives because God gives us the victory through the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. You know, when Jesus drew his last breath, an earthquake erupted. The rocks were split in half. And immediately as Jesus bowed his head and surrendered his spirit to God, the veil in the temple was torn in two. You see, under the old covenant, only the high priests were allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies, which was where God's presence dwelt behind the veil in the temple. And even they were only allowed to enter that sacred space on the Day of Atonement, so restricted was access into the presence of the Lord under the old way. But you see, when the veil was torn at Jesus' death, effectively Jesus, as God's chosen high priest who will hold that position forever and ever, effectively he was tearing down the veil of separation and offering us direct access to God the Father through his sacrifice. He was re-establishing the true intimacy and relationship with our Creator and returning us back to our Garden of Eden heritage of unhindered communion with the Father. Like Adam and Eve walking and talking in the cool of the day. This was the redemptive plan from the beginning of time and Jesus fulfilled it at Calvary. He became the firstborn of the dead, Revelation 1 and 4 says. And as we are united as one in Christ Jesus, all the firstborn inheritances that are bestowed upon Jesus as God's firstborn are ours as well to share in, including the greatest inheritance of all, which is an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. Unmerited favour bought by the blood of the Lamb. I remember on my wedding day, when the, 25 years ago now, but I remember on the wedding day when the minister pronounced Jamie and me husband and wife. From that moment, from the moment my veil was lifted, I took on a brand new, new name as Mrs. Nicole Zock. You see, there is a transfer from the former and into the new when we enter into a wedding ceremony. While still under my wedding veil, I was my former self, Miss Nicole Senning. <laughs> but at the moment that my veil was lifted and the minister pronounced me as his husband and wife, so too did a shift take place in my identity. At that moment, I entered into something brand new and glorious that was vowed in through the marriage union ceremony. From that day forward, I became grafted into my husband's family and he was grafted into mine. His inheritance became my inheritance and vice versa. And the same thing occurs when Jesus, when we declare Jesus as Lord of our lives. Our veil is lifted once and for all and we take on the brand new name of Jesus Christ. We leave the former lives behind and we are adopted and grafted into God's family. We become sons and daughters of the highest. His promises become our promises. We inherit the kingdom of God. This is the great and glorious revelation of the Easter story that is found only in the name of Jesus. Because as Galatians 4 tells us, when the right time came, God 
sent his son born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy our freedom from being slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us as his own children. And since we are now children, God has now made us his heir to his will. Everything the Father has, he gives to us. Because Romans 8 tells us that we are God's beloved children. We are worthy and qualified through the sacrifice of our eldest brother Jesus, the firstborn of the dead, the new creation who has secured our share in all of his treasures, secured us into his inheritance, into all that he has and all that he is. This is what Jesus' life bought for you and for me. No merit on our behalf, can I say. No works could ever ensure that we could gain such a favour. It is purely a gift bought by the Son of God, which comes with 100% lifetime guarantee of unmerited favour and amazing grace. Amen. It was always God's plan from the beginning of time to send a saviour into the world. God knew we couldn't fulfill the law on our own as we sent Jesus, his beloved son, to fulfill what man could not. He who knew no sin bore our sins so that all who choose to believe in the name of Jesus will have eternal life and will dwell in God's unrestricted, accessible presence for the rest of eternity. This is the Easter story, a story of redemption and love and unmerited faith of all God by the one and only name. There really is no greater name than the name of Jesus. And one day very soon, Jesus will come back to his beloved bride. And when he comes, no one will be able to ignore the true identity of the Son of God. He will descend with a, from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of a card. He will come on clouds of glory with greater power and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him on the cross and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. And then every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and Whoa. under the earth and every tongue will be set Church. And again, I think it's for, for others as well. 
Well, the dream that I had, we weren't actually in this building. We were in a much bigger building. And there were hundreds of people in this auditorium. And we were getting ready to do a service. And I was looking around and going, oh my gosh, there's so many people in Lower Dalston. And so I went out to the foyer and I said to a gentleman, I sort of tapped him on the shoulder and I said, why have you come to Dalston today? And he just looked at me quizzically. And he said, what do you mean? Why wouldn't I be here? And I said, okay. And he said, everyone here is here for the same reason. And I said, okay, which is? And he said, we have heard about the things that is happening in Dallasford. We have heard of the deliverances and the healings. And we have heard that the glory cloud is over Dallasford Community Church. And everyone here has come for the same reason. We want to partake of the healings. We want to partake of the glory cloud that is over this church. I was super excited. There were people from all over Melbourne from different nations that had come. And as I went back, and I was out in the foyer, when I came back into the church service, I could sense pride. And I could sense self-glory in the room. I could sense um, rebellion was in the room. Some of those spirits. And when I woke the next morning, the Lord said to me, I want you to ask your people, are they ready for what comes next? Are you ready in your heart for the glory that is imminent, that he is about to pour out, not just in Dalesford, but around the globe? Are you ready? Because yeah. I will not abide in self-glory. Right. And if there's yeah, self-glory yeah, yeah. attached, yeah. I need you to deal with it now. In this era of the, the selfie, you know, yeah. I will not abide in this. I want you to, to make sure my fame is like that as Mark spoke in about when, when Jesus was delivering a demon and his fame went right, spread like wildfire throughout Galilee. Amen. It is all about Jesus and he's saying, I want you to check your spirits because you have been asking me for the greater measure. And I'm about to outpour it. In fact, I believe today is part of that. So about um, this time last year, I asked for a double portion of the Elisha spirit. About two weeks ago, someone prophesied over me and said, you have the double portion of the Elisha spirit. And then this week, Emma Stark from Glasgow Prophetic Centre said that, this was on the 1st of April, today there is a, a moment where God is, is um, sending out a double portion of the Elisha spirits for anyone who is ready to receive it. Now, if you don't know what a double portion of Elisha's spirit is, it is Elisha, Elisha did exactly double the amount of miracles and healings and deliverances yes. that, the, that Elijah did. Mm -hmm. And you see, when we hear the, the, the scripture, we read the scripture of having greater measure, of doing greater miracles than Jesus did, that is a double portion. And I believe that God is wanting to usher that today. That is the Easter message. The, the Eastern message is that his resurrection power, it, was, it came up and he's given us that power. But are we ready? Are we ready to receive a church? Because it comes with a weight of responsibility. It is not for the faint hearted. It comes with a weight of responsibility to, to that we have to steward. And God is saying, it is yours. I'm about to, to, to place it upon your church. And the nations will come as has been prophesied. Are you ready to hold on to this strong way? So I'd like to get the, the band back up this, this morning. And if that is you, if you are wanting a double portion of the Elisha spirit, I'd really like to, to pray over you this morning. And I'll get out. And I think that that, that um, Roger's already sensing a real, a real um, atmosphere of healing and deliverance in the space this morning. So I'll definitely get Roger up this morning as well. But if we believe in the resurrected power of Jesus Christ, then we have to believe that he is wanting to do the miraculous in our midst as well. He is wanting to do the healings. And I saw it in a dream and I tell you, 
and, and they have seen it as well when he was prophesying. This is what God is doing. This is that glory that, that God has been promising us. And so now, if you would like to receive a double portion of the Elisha spirit in readiness for what comes next, I'd like you to come up into the mosh pit. <laughs> come up into this section. We're just gonna, I'm just going to pray.